Matt, I can't believe I'm about to say this sentence, but we're about to discuss the seventh Al Yankovic album. I don't know how we got through seven of these albums already. It's it's uh, it's moving fast now. It suddenly feels like this is our first. Uh, we've we've arrived in the '90s. Yes, we're, and we're what, here in what the What better 90s. song to first talk about for the 90s? You know, I'm going to bring our guest in now, but I have so much information about just the process of Off the Deep End before we even dive into the song. We are joined once again by fan favorite guest, uh, a person that some people say should just be host a permanent favorite co-host. guest. Yeah, host favorite as well. <laughs> uh, MC Lars. Uh, Lars, welcome back to talk about Smells Like Nirvana. Thanks. I didn't know what to wear today, so... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so, real quick, this album came out in 1992. The recording of it started in early 1990. Um, so, this was also the first album Al self-produced. Uh, it was met with positive reviews. It actually peaked at number 17 on the Billboard 200, which is pretty awesome. But literally, he waited two years until a song came out that he thought, okay, this is the song that can be the lead single. Uh, and I, I have a couple quotes leading up to this. He said... I really didn't have any good, really good reason why it took so long other than the fact that I was waiting for Michael Jackson's new album to come out, he explained. Unfortunately for Yankovic, the new album hit a couple snags. Uh, When Dangerous was released after hearing Black or White, Al approached Jackson with a potential parody entitled... Snack All Night. Snack All Night. Uh, Although Jackson was a huge supporter of his work, he felt that the parody would damage the song's positive message. Uh, and told him if he wanted, he could parody any other song off the album, but not Black or White. So then Al turned his attention to Guns N' Roses because they had just released their version of Live and Let Die. And he approached Paul McCartney with... Chicken Pot Pie. Chicken Pot Pie. There Chicken we go. Pot Pie. <laughs> McCartney, uh, though also a supporter of Al's work, said that he would love him to parody one of his songs, but he was going to turn it down because as a vegetarian, he could not condone the eating of animal flesh even in a fictional song. Uh, Yankovic uh, understood that, also being a vegetarian. Um, And then Nirvana happened. And we've heard the stories of the Nirvana situation, uh, and we're going to dive into it deeper, but like the paragraphs upon paragraphs upon paragraphs that are written just about this parody, the story of how it came to be, the story of the music video, the story... like. This must be the most documented Al Yankovic song, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, well, because it also comes with, like, it's Al's parody of, I mean, I I don't think we could say this again. Like, Al is parodying a song that is, like, just considered to be a universal truth, that this is, like, a change in the pop music culture forever moment. Like, even the biggest songs he has done up until this point, I don't think people talk about the way that they talk about Smells Like Teen Spirit. Yeah. Well, I, and I want to paint another picture for you that I learned while researching this because I never thought about it from this lens. Like I said, he started recording this in 1990. Yeah. So some of the parodies that he had recorded at that time, he did The White Stuff with New Kids on the Block. Mm-hmm. He did I Can't Watch This with MC Hammer. Yep. And he did the plumber song for Millie Vanilli. Yes. And uh, up to a certain point, I Can't Watch This was going to be the lead single. Like they had pressed singles to send promotional singles for radio stations and everything. But in the time that he was waiting for more songs to parody, it was like the Millie Vanilli scandal happened and they were gone. Like new kids on the block kind of disappeared. Like hammer already kind of fell off around that point. Like that was like, and he was sitting there like, I have three parodies of three artists that already nobody cares about, which is funny that, you know, he records smells like Nirvana and then the other parody that he records is Taco Grande, which I would say <laughs> fell off even harder than the New Kids and it's MC Hammer did. the most Hammer forgotten. Did. Well, maybe <laughs> that or the Millie Vanilli track is maybe yeah. the most forgotten of the parodies on this record. But yeah, no, and I mean, so you were saying it earlier, like the length of time it took to make this record. Like it is also not a coincidence that this is coming off of UHF, which was a, you know, the number of times in Al's career he has had what could be considered a near career killer. And UHF is a strong contender, and I think it was probably, well, I mean, Al has also said in interviews many times that he was, now in hindsight, so grateful that Michael Jackson turned him down, because Yeah, because he would have just been the Michael Jackson guy. Yeah, If he had recorded another food-based Michael Jackson parody, 
this is another example in his career where like we might maybe we're not doing this podcast right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like that it, it could have potentially not worked. It, it, it might have just been enough to make it like this is definitely a one note act. Yes. And uh, we've had our fill pun. Well, I want to dive into this quick story and then I want to bounce over to Lars because we've talked about this before and Lars has given us some more insight than what we normally get publicly about this. Um, so Al was really having trouble getting permission for this parody. He needed to get it approved by Kurt Cobain. Uh, Victoria Jackson was on the cast of SNL. Nirvana was going to be performing. He gets Victoria Jackson to get Cobain on the phone so he can talk to it. Uh, reportedly, Cobain uh, agreed, but asked if the new parody was going to be about food. Yankovic told him it was going to be about how no one could understand the lyrics to his song, which Cobain thought was very funny. There's also, you know, he says Cobain said something along the lines of that's how he knew that they had made it was that when Al uh, asked them to do a parody. Lars, you've told us before that if you actually read, uh, I believe you said it was called Serve the Servant, uh, a book by about a biography written by Kurt Cobain's manager, that um, it wasn't 100% like roses and good times uh, with Kurt Cobain in this parody. Yeah. Uh, thanks for asking me that. And this is not... This is just something that surprised me when I read Danny Goldberg's Serving the Servant book, which came out in 2019. Uh, I'm going to read from it real quick okay. for context. Um, and I'm not, it's, it's, the part's not that long. So he talks about how, how the story you just told. And then he talks about later, he goes, a few months later. So Kurt, Kurt listened, nodded his head and said, this sounds great, Al, when they were at Saturday Night Live. A few months later, we got advanced copies for the video of Smells Like Nirvana. And when I didn't hear from Kurt for a couple of days, I was worried he was pissed at me for facilitating it. I had initially felt it was an honor of sorts to be on the list of superstars that Weird Al had made fun of. But I didn't know how Kurt would react to actually seeing a character of himself on MTV. And I was a little unnerved by the comic presence that also made comic premise that also made fun of Nirvana's fans. So Kurt ended up liking it. But this is where it came out that like he wasn't completely pleased with the parody. However, a few months later, when the Weird Al album came out with a promotional image of Al naked in the water chasing a donut on a fish hook, Kurt told a writer from Flipside that he thought Weird Al had taken advantage of Nirvana to market himself beyond anything that Kurt had expected. Okay. So, so no one wants to add that footnote, but I think it's more about the album cover, right? Yeah. Like then, he liked the video, and I would. You were talking about career saving. I think there's five career saving songs in Al's career yeah. that kept him going. So eat it in '84, yep. fat in '88, yep. smells like Nirvana in '92, yep. Amish Paradise, yep. which in '96. That's all every four years. Mm -hmm. So that's like a new generation of high schoolers and middle schoolers. Yep. And then white and nerdy ten years later. Ten years. And then the whole nostalgia fest and of mandatory fun. And now ten years later, the movie. Yes. yes. So like absolutely, those are seven. But the five songs, like each of those kept it moving yeah and, um, and and we're it's interesting that there was two michael songs in there it's funny like if you're looking at it through that lens i totally agree with you on those five tracks abs that is like new generations introduced to this man by hitting a cultural moment at the time that just was perfect right like he yeah. just absolutely nailed it two michael jackson songs and then two hip-hop tracks this is the one in the middle that is the most unique of all of them, because it hit this particular moment, like, and it's also like, I mean, at chart wise, I don't know if this was the biggest. I'm, it wasn't actually. I know it wasn't because I know White and Nerdy was his biggest hit. But this ever. was this was his biggest hit since Eat It for sure. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Yeah, it it the song was the second highest charting single after Eat It. It was his uh, second top forty hit. Yeah, yeah. Um. So the other thing that's worth noting about this though is that uh, Nirvana's record label or an executive at Nirvana's label uh, DGC actually said that smells like Nirvana was responsible for them selling an additional million copies of Nevermind. Of course. So, you know, that's that Al weird Al bump. bump. Yeah. Like, the weird Al bump. You got to get it. You got to get it. I also have to point out, cause we told that story very quickly, but like Victoria Jackson should hope that the most significant thing that she ever did was facilitate this parody <laughs> at this point in her career. And with everything that has happened to Victoria Jackson, like the fact that she is the one who made this happen, because the other thing I saw is that Al had reached out to management time after time after time and was getting nothing back. 
could not get in touch with Kurt, could not get ap- approval at all. And it was just that once Victoria put them on the phone together, it was an immediate like, oh, yeah, sure. Sounds fine. Yeah, no, 100%. Because, yeah, she, we, we, owe, we talked about we that. We owe on that the, to Victoria the, Jackson, and we owe very little else to Victoria Jackson. Yeah, but say, that's fine. From, for more of that, check out our UAF, UHF commentary track that we released yeah, uh, a couple do, months ago. We do get into some of that stuff, yeah. Um, so the other thing that I read was that recording this specific song was actually like really unique and different for the whole band um, because it was kind of the first time that they didn't have to do a bunch of overdubs. Like they just, like the the garagey, sloppy sound almost of Nirvana, uh, they just were able to sit down and do it pretty straightforward. Uh, there was a quote actually from John Schwartz who said that the drum part is so loose, the tempos just keep going up and down, and we adjusted the tempos on our song to meet with Nirvana's version, but it was uh, by no means a steady performance. <laughs> so I have to say, this is, brings up a good point. Now, this is some real like music nerdy minutia here, but I'm going to get into it. First of all, I was surprised because I read that same quote. If you listen to these two songs, if you listen to Al's version and the Nirvana version side by side, Al's is definitely a little faster. Yeah. He is playing it. They are playing it a little bit quicker than... Uh, than the Nirvana version. It, listen to Al's and then start listening to Smells Like Teen Spirit and the slowness of the opening riff is actually kind of shocking. Yeah. Uh, it's not a fast song. And also, I have to say, and this is a con- a criticism I will very, very rarely lodge because I almost, oh, I, I don't think I've ever felt this way about anything up until this point. I actually do think that they slightly missed the mark on the recording quality of this parody it does not sound as good as the nirvana track now i okay all of the nevermind's record a part of the reason why it is so famous like if even aside from the sound quality like it is an incredibly well made record it sounds amazing it is like aggressive and gnarly and raw while still being super slick and clean and well produced the only thought i could think of in the choruses of al's version you can really hear there are way less guitars uh, it just sounds more like a live band playing. So Al's vocal is much more present and upfront. And I'm assuming that they must have thought like we if <laughs> it would be a hilarious irony. But if people can't understand Al's lyrics, then the whole thing is blown. Right. We need yeah. people to be sure that they can hear every word Al is singing about how people can't understand <laughs> what Kurt is singing. Otherwise, the whole joke is lost. But listening to the two of them side by side, I actually do feel like it's not as it's not as sharp a sound alike as I am used to hearing from Al and yeah. his band. I, I also feel like you have to give credit where, because it was it's Butch that did Nevermind, right? Butch, Butch Vig. Yeah. You're going from Nevermind, Nirvana, established producer Butch Vig to Weird Al's first ever attempt as a producer. <laughs> yeah, and it was recorded at Sound City in, in yeah, California. Like, I mean, this is like a this is a top shelf recording. Yeah. <laughs> uh that they did for uh for Nevermind. Um so Wait, did they Matt, are you saying Weird Al didn't record this at Sound City? He did no, not. He no, he did it. No. He, yeah. They did it on their on their own as they I they somewhere in California, but not at Sound City. Yeah, um, so I think that the Nirvana had the uh Definitely had the more experience, even though they were a newer band. Yeah, behind the production side. But of it's things. just interesting yeah. on the on UHF. I noted I actually felt like you know Al and his band got a slicker sounding performance of Money for Nothing. Yeah. Than the Dire Straits version, like it actually sounds so sharp and clear and like it's be- perfectly produced. And again, you're right. I hadn't even considered that this is the first album without Rick Derringer. So maybe that is maybe some uh, inexperiences at play in that regard. I don't know. That's, you know, hey, fair enough. Hey, Milligan. Yeah. Milligan. Let me, in terms of the lyrics, you made a good point that I wanted to quote something else from the, from Kurt Cobain's manager's book yes. about why he liked the lyrical parody. Yeah. Okay. To, ma- to many Nirvana fans, Smells Like Teen Spirit played the same role that Allen Ginsberg's Hal did for the Beat Generation or Like a Rolling Stone did for the Boomers. Kurt enjoyed the Weird Al parody of his most famous song, but I felt that some old school rock fans missed the point of Weird Al's flippant opening in the voice of a Philistine. What is this song all about? Can't figure any lyrics out. To me, Weird Al is affecting the attitude of someone who doesn't get Nirvana, but actual Nirvana fans had no problem understanding the meaning of the lines like, with the lights out, it's less dangerous, here we are now, entertain us. Part of the joy and liberation that the song provides is the ability to separate yourself from those who are of, of overly controlled by mainstream culture and, and to know that in rejecting it, you become more powerful. 
So like people who who like to wear the shirt but don't really understand the lyrics. Yeah. That's yeah. what Danny thinks he's making fun of, which I think is cool. I think it's totally true. And I also, you know, uh, to go back to the lyrics, there's something I love about this is a great so with the exception of a couple of things, this is the first this is a big marker in Al doing a song, a parody about the original. You know, we've talked about like, again, like still Billy Joel to me, of course, is like the, there's some self self referential moments that he has done up until this point. But this is the first time he's done a hit. Yeah. Uh, talking about what he's talking about, the original thing that he's parodying um, and the original lyrics to Smells Like Teen Spirit are legendarily obtuse. Right. Like to this day. You can go online and you can read for hours about people's theories and ideas about what some of the lines of this song mean. There are there's not a consensus on on some of the lyrics. I, my understanding is that Smells Like Teen Spirit was written based on like just random lines of poetry that he sort of strung together to form a song. And it wasn't yeah. like that's this is not like it's not a narrative in this song. So Al pointing out. There's some something really interesting here about the idea of Al pointing out that you don't understand the lyrics, but the lyrics also being so obtuse and hard to wrap your head around in the first place. Kind of, it almost doesn't matter as much. Like well, the like isn't the that spirit also, of the song is the whole thing. Like it, it's okay. I feel like a lot of Nevermind was also just like what syllables make the most sense, right? Because like you have like if you grab that uh DGC records uh compilation that has like Einstein at the beach by Counting Crows and like all these deep cuts it has um i want to say it's go away by Nirvana on it but it's called pay to play and it's like completely different lyrics to the exact same song because mm. they were just like it was way more i i think that people forget that like shoegaze was such a huge element of what Nirvana was doing in right. the sense of that it was this like the music is is so not important to or the lyrics are so not important to anything. It's kind of what became like the driving force of something like math core. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. math core is such a hard thing for some people to wrap their head around because it's like, well, why would you make an album where you have the drums and the bass so much louder in the mix than what the guitar and the vocals are doing and that like the vocals are being treated more like a background instrument and the bass line is being treated like the lead vocal mix. Like it's, it's not normal to like pop music and Nirvana kind of found that perfect magic sauce uh, to do all of it. And I, and Al yeah. talks about the lyrics a lot in interviews. Like I saw that one thing he said was like, I try not to go with the obvious route with my songs, but sometimes the most obvious is also still the best. And like writing, a song like that. Uh, one of the lines that made me laugh was that he he said he woke up in the middle of the night and just wrote down the phrase "Bargle Nobles House" on a piece of paper. I love that line so much. I think that is the most like that's my favorite joke of the the whole song. The it's hard to bargle Noddle's house with all these marbles in my mouth. <laughs> yeah, like that is just. I don't know. That's like, it's just so, so brilliant and clever and funny and feels like the sort of thing. Like I can't imagine anyone else <laughs> coming up with that. I, th I think one of my other him. favorite lines in here is sing distinctly. We don't want to, Yeah, <laughs> like, it's just a good, it's a good line. You know, like you dive into all of like, I, I'm reading about like the way he did the recordings and it was like for the verses, Yankovic mumbles the lyrics in the song. He placed several cookies in his mouth to achieve a more garbled effect. Like, the the gargling of water for the for the guitar solo and replacing the leads with like kazoos and tubas and everything like it's just it's such an as much as they say like oh we didn't have to do nearly as many overdubs in this as we did on past songs like there's still a lot of extra shit that they threw into this song with oh, sound there's effects all the wacky and, sound effects yeah. and stuff and the the cow and I really like the sheep doing yeah. the the bleat of a sheep is very it's actually a very good sound to like for the bend the guitar bend that Nirvana does in there. One thing that I didn't mention I never mentioned is that I saw him play this the first concert I went to was the Alapalooza tour in Santa Cruz and that was uh April 28th which was like 3 weeks after Cobain killed himself. Yeah. And yeah. Al said before he said I want to dedicate this to the memory of Kurt Cobain and it felt like a a tribute to him because Kurt Cobain committed suicide on that tour but he kept playing it. It was just interesting. I remember he Dedicated as like yeah. an homage to him. I, so I, I, did, I like did you pull up the same thing that I pulled I, up? I yeah. might have, yeah, but I don't have an exact quote, so you can so, you have one. So yeah, they were hesitant to play it, and it was at the peak of the popularity of the song, and that for several months, Yankovic would perform it as a more somber 
version of the song and and he would like give a tribute to Cobain before playing the song but uh apparently Yankovic was supposed to play a show in Seattle and they were like really not sure if they should do it and it wasn't until a bunch of journalists uh that were interviewing them from the Seattle press was like no I think that you should actually do it I think yeah. it would be cathartic for the area uh, and that the performance went over better than he had anticipated. Um, and that's when he decided it was okay. I also yeah. saw a quote, Bermuda Schwartz noted that that was the first time as a touring act like this, that they had had to deal with this, that yeah. they had parodied a song of someone who had died and now had to figure out a way to do it and not feel weird. <laughs> you know, like it's, it's a tough thing. Cause it's like, it's a spe- well, this one, especially, because it's actively like pointed at the guy who died. I mean, again, I don't think anyone would listen to this and think it was being mean to Kurt. Uh, but it is still like, you know, even gently poking fun at a, someone who had just committed suicide is like a pretty tough yeah, thing to, to feel good about doing on a stage. Although I can appreciate I'm, I don't doubt at all that the people of Seattle must have found it to be very uh, cathartic to hear yeah. it again in full, full volume. Yeah. I also just want to bring this up because I, I think it's really funny that at the 1992 MTV Video Awards, they had a ri- they had asked Nirvana to play and Nirvana had declined. So then they extended the offer to Yankovic to perform Smells Like Nirvana instead. Uh, and then Nirvana changed their mind and said they would perform. And Yankovic has joked that he's pretty sure that the offer to him was just a bargaining chip to get Nirvana to say yes to doing the awards show. <laughs> Um, and I, I wouldn't put it past, <laughs> past MTV to have that exact thought. Like, was that, that was the, ep- that was episode where, where Chris hit himself in the head. That's with exactly the bass. Yeah, right. That was where he knocked and himself cl- out. Clocked his nug bone. Yeah. He uh, threw his I, bass in the air and, and knocked himself unconscious. It's, there's video footage of that. It's crazy. The Nirvana Weird Al connection. That's going to go, we're going to, we're going to bring it up now, but we will absolutely at some point have to do an episode of just Al's appearances on the Simpsons. Um, but mm, infamously, yeah. in the episode, that 90s show uh, is a flashback to the 90s when Homer is shown to have created one of the first grunge bands uh, to help him cope with Marge's infidelity. It's a very weird episode. A band called Sadgasm. Uh, <laughs> and at one point, he writes a song called Shave Me, which is obviously a parody of Nirvana's Rape Me. Uh, and then Weird Al, who voices himself in the episode, parodies the song as Brain Freeze. And uh, Homer takes Yankovic's parody as a sign that his band has become successful, uh, but his depressive state after breaking up with Marge leaves him unable to enjoy the song's humor as he says the infamous quote, he who is tired of Weird Al is also tired of life. That quote has become really popular. If you go on, I feel like, go on YouTube and look up videos of Al, any music video of Al, any live performance of Al, someone, one of the top comments is just going to be that quote, that Homer that quote Simpson from the quote. Simpsons. People are, people are really going out of their way to keep that quote alive. It, it is very, uh, very fitting. Do you guys know the origin of that quote? No. And please tell us because I feel like that quote is the highlight of what is otherwise a pretty rough episode of The Simpsons, actually. It, um, in 1791, Samuel Johnson said, he who is tired of London is tired of life. Ooh. So it's a riff on that. Famous oh, literary quote. Look at Didn't that. know that. Yeah. That's great. Well, Lars, I've never yeah. done this before, but we're almost 25 minutes into the episode, and I have not even asked you, why did you want us to discuss Smells Like Nirvana? Dang. That's nice you asked me that. <laughs> well, so a uh, few interesting things, right? She says, we're a garage band from Seattle, but as everyone knows, Nirvana is famously from Aberdeen, yep. which is two hours west, right? So like that didn't rhyme as well. So it's an example <laughs> of like ma- making fun of the fan, the casual fan. I, I just thought that was interesting to, sh- yeah. to share. Um, the original lyric, load up on guns, right? There's a sad irony in that Kurt Cobain yeah. did load up on one specific gun. Yes. Yeah. And um, my little group will always be until the end. I'm paraphrasing that line. Nirvana's legacy outlasted the sad introduction of them in the, in the literary context there. Mm-hmm. So I thought it's interesting how... He makes a song about how you can't understand the lyrics, but when you work to understand the lyrics, it says a lot about that band's place in culture and how punk and thrash entered the mainstream. And I always had the opinion that like Nirvana was the first pop punk band because they loved the Beatles as much as they loved like Minor Threat. Yeah. You know, it's like c- connecting those two things. And Al, if you look at the origin, like post punk and all that stuff was really part of the fir- the early Al's music. So like he had kind of comes out of a similar place of loving pop 
we, and thrash music. We, I want to get into that when we talk about the music video, uh, because yeah, I think that Al's appreciation of punk music back in the eighties really helps with this video because there is there is another version of this video in an alternate universe where it is someone who doesn't have that love and appreciation where this video feels like old man yelling at cloud yeah. no it's true. <laughs> like, like... I, I also did see there was a uh, an example you know we talked before about al's taste and how i think al has very um based on his originals and his parodies i think al has very hip music taste like I think he's like a record store guy in my opinion I, that's how it seems to me and he had said that he heard this song he already knew Nirvana which means he was hip to Nirvana in the Bleach era where they were on sub pop and were a very very small like another like grunge bands like Mud Honey or the Pixies where you really had to be in the know to be listening to yeah. these bands and heard this song and loved it but did not initially think it was going to be big enough to parody Oh, wow. And and he was nervous. He like liked the song so much and wanted to do it, but then did not think it was going to, you know, we talked a little bit about this and he, like coming off of UHF and the amount of time he's spent making this record. Like he knew that the big like lead single parody for this record had to crush. Yeah, this was a this was a make or break moment for him and he needed to parody something that was going to be huge. Um, and that's why he waited so long to find the right thing. And I mean, he got rejected a couple times in the process. But even when he heard the song and, and liked it, was nervous. He had waited until it uh, unexpectedly, again, for the whole world, unexpectedly shot to the top of the charts. And suddenly he was like, great, I can do it. <laughs> I'm ready and, to go. And I mean, let's be honest here. I just I mean, I'm sure that they're funny. There is no way that snack all night. Or chicken pot pie no, that's, was going yeah. to have the impact. That's that what I'm saying. Sounds. Like, even like, if they were <laughs> funny, even if they were great, like, yeah, no, this he needed to reinvent himself. Yeah. This was a this was a, a critical, critical moment for him to show people that he was capable of doing more than what people had already heard yeah. and seen or not seen that in the case of UHF. <laughs> Look, I know that we're I know that all three of us are coming in this as children of the 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so we have some type of rose tinted glasses tied to that. But I do think that this Nirvana song being successful really I mean, like up until this point, yes, we've seen Al dabble with different genres. But I feel like even in the grand scheme of things, they're all kind of in this like new wavy like bubble that he's playing around with, like new wave and pop music bubble. And then from this, like, I don't think without a smells like Nirvana, you would get him doing a song like Germs, where he's like, I'm going to attempt industrial music now. It's a good point. I'm I'm looking now. Yeah. Had he done anything this heavy? I mean, the only thing I can think of that even came close to being let me like, be your hug. <laughs> well, let me let me be your hog is obviously a, a a banger. Like, I mean, stuck in a closet with Vanna White is like touches on some like heavy metal vibes, but that's like hair. Like, it's not like this. Like, this is. Yeah. But of course, also, this is a new musical moment. The fact yeah. that you're right, Matt. The fact that he had such success with hitting another genre like this and and doing something so different, like, definitely must have given him confidence that he could. Because you know that, about... that led him to the path of doing like hip hop parodies later on and doing all these different things and just trusting that people will follow him. If the song is good, it does the genre is not really that important. Yeah, because I'm thinking about even like we get to Alapalooza and it's you know, listeners who have checked us out on other podcasts already kind of know my opinions of Alapalooza, but like I don't I don't know if if he doesn't have a huge success with smells like Nirvana, does he? give Red Hot Chili Peppers a shot? Does he yeah. do something as weird as going all the way back to MacArthur Park? You know what I mean? Like, I think right. I think this succeeding really gave him the permission to play around in as many sandboxes as he felt interested in to, like, find the next thing. You know, in January of 92, Nirvana dethrones Dangerous by Michael Jackson as the number one record, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And so, like, that, I agree with you, Matt Kay, that he was given license, but also at this point, MTV had like Gen X was really defining the mass culture taste and music was shifting. So like part of your argument is that he went along with the shifting of culture True. and that's yeah. what gave him longevity. Not so much that he was trying new things. It, it was more like he was reflecting what was changing a lot. Yeah, I guess that that's, I guess that that's fair because I mean, I love eighties music as much as the next person. Again, I'm a child in nineties. I'm always going to have extra love and respect for the nineties, but like, 
the 80s 80s music regardless of what the genre is whether you're talking about hip hop rock music pop music they all kind of fit into the same aesthetic bubble and then you get into the 90s and it's like gangster rap and nirvana and nine inch nails are three very distinctly different musical quadrants yeah. that are happening at yeah, once. Yeah, I mean, the like, reason why Nirvana was such a big moment in music was because all of the stuff you're describing at the 80s was considered safe. Yeah. They were I safe mean, keep choices. In mind that Again, we're talking about yeah. Beastie Boys are doing songs and they're having the guy from Slayer on. Like, you know what I mean? Like, it's like that whole, like, it yeah. was just like the. The 80s was just such a giant dome. Yeah. No, yeah. And and the excitement about Nirvana came from the fact that it felt not safe. Yes. It didn't feel like a version, like a a uh, very carefully produced. And again, I think it's funny because this the the, the Nirvana record is very carefully produced. <laughs> very, and and very. they were trying to make a hit record. Like if you like if for people who don't know, like if you want to go back and listen to Bleach by Nirvana, the album that precedes this before they had Dave Grohl on drums, like, boy, is that a nasty, heavy, not hooky record. Except that uh, you still have pop songs like About a Girl. Like, About a Girl is like the poppiest song I think Nirvana's ever released, and it's on Oh, I, I'm sorry. I'm, yeah. I'm mostly referring to the aesthetic of the record. The aesthetic, Like, like yes, when yes. they went in for, for Nevermind, they were like, we are making a hit record. Yes. And no, that no, was true. the that was the bold swing that they took is they were like, we're going to like write these songs the way that we write them. We want it to be noisy. We want it to be aggressive. We want it to be like intense, but we also want it to be a pop radio yeah. thing. You know, like and they, they took it one step further when they get in there and do in utero where it's like half that album is just feedback. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, insane. Exactly. It's exactly <laughs> yeah. 91 Donkey Lane is a magical apartment complex that contains immense power, but lacks intelligent inhabitants. What is happening? I'm getting texts. Why are we getting a lot of texts? People found out what we did. Oh, dividing Mike Myers into an infinite amount of tiny Mike Myers? Listen to 91 Donkey Lane for free on Spotify or your favorite podcasting app. More at 91donkeylane.com. See you there, you donkeys. Let's talk about the music video a little bit. A few facts here. It was directed by by Jay Levy, uh, fresh off of doing UHF. Uh, and it's a pretty shot for shot of the original video. It's funny. You were talking about the difference in the speed of the song. Um, when I went on YouTube and I typed in Smells Like Nirvana, I wasn't paying attention. And the first thing that came up was Nirvana Smells Like Teen Spirit. And I clicked it. And it was a solid 10 to 15 seconds into the video before I was like, this is the wrong video. This is no, the real yeah, video. The the, uh, the opening is um, some, of the, some, some of the shots are absolutely identical. And um, they talked about that. They said that Yankovic used the same props, the same actors, meticulously rewatched the video to get the same camera angles, shot it in the same Culver City soundstage that they shot the video in, uh, hired the same actor to repraise the role of the janitor. Uh, and they were even able to have a conversation with Samuel Bayer, who was the original director, to prepare for the video shoot. Uh, and Yankovic noted that uh, he certainly went along with it, but he felt that Breyer was the least enthusiastic person about seeing his work parodied. Um, and then up in 2009 on a Twitter post, Tony Hawk revealed that he's one of the extras uh, skateboarding in the video and uh, Al was not aware of that until he saw that tweet. I love that. Apparently they brought in a bunch of like local Let's skater go. kids <laughs> and Tony Hawk was one of them. You, I, it's unclear where he would actually be in the video. Like you don't really see. I mean, I don't know if you'd recognize baby baby Tony Hawk. Yeah, no, it's, you know, he got the same uh, same stuff. The uh, janitor who I love the fact that they got the same janitor. Tony De La Rosa is his name. They noted that they brought him back on and they, they said it seemed like he didn't know who Nirvana was. He didn't care about anything. He was just like, yeah, you want me to do this again? Sure. No problem. He was just more than happy to, uh, to, uh, no questions know, about check. putting on a tutu and, and doing and a little dance. Yeah. <laughs> There's a scene where he pulled, he pulls the donut out of the cleaner thing. And I always thought about the cover of the album, the donut. And the yeah, water. that's right. That's right. Yeah. 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 So, yeah a great little you, extra. You know, and also, you know, the subtitles, it goes, boy, this ought to bug your parents. Yeah. I always felt like they showed that because it does sound like if you didn't know, boy, this ought to F your parents. I, it sounds a little like that. Lars, I have a similar theory with the Dare to be Stupid video where he holds up a video yeah. screen that just shows the lyrics for you can just give up the ship because I'm like, I feel right. like they put that because it sounds so close to shit 
in the yeah. way that he's singing it in that Devo voice. That they're like, it's okay, kids. It's still a PG rated <laughs> album. You're you're good. Um, and speaking about yeah, maybe yeah. Speaking about PG and G rated, uh, I was doing a little bit of research uh, for you know when we get to 1997, we're going to take a pause from Al's music. And we're going to dedicate 13 episodes to watching the 13 episodes of the Weird Al show that aired on Saturday mornings. And I was mm. reading in my research that one of the reasons that that show was so short-lived was that Al really struggled with finding the balance of what was acceptable on Saturday morning TV with what is a slightly more darker lean in his style of comedy. And boy, is this video filled with some of that darker lean where you've got like the the kids get escalating to the point that they're ripping each other's heads and arms off throughout the uh, the performance and blowing up buildings. <laughs> like, it, it, it's a really great yeah. I mean we're we're sort of like we're describing it, but I'm, I haven't like expressed this yet. But like this video is really amazingly well done because yeah. the original again it's I would recommend people do the A B because the comparisons to the two videos are really close. But as we pointed out. Uh, like the money for nothing video is also really close, but kind of doesn't do anything or say anything. It just feels like it's the same video twice. The Nirvana video. I often feel like it's difficult in retrospect to fully appreciate this cultural significance of something like this after the fact, right? Like we all can go back and know I was not old enough to have a memory of this song blowing up. I was too young for like the moment where this song hit. I, I remember the hearing after that Kurt, Kurt was already dead. I knew that before I knew this song. I, I remember hearing that he had died and knowing that that was a big deal, but yeah. not enough. I did. I just was too young. I would have been uh, like six or seven years old at this time when this came out. So I, and I was not my, it was not a musical household I grew up in. So none of this was, was just in my vocabulary at all. But if you watch this video, this is like the Nirvana video I'm talking about. It It is really bleak. This is like a dystopian. I mean, this is at least the imagery I get from this is these kids living in like a dystopian hellscape sitting in the bleachers. It, it just looks like it's like something out of a David Lynch movie. You know what I mean? It's like everything is gone. Like there's nothing left in the world. And it's all these kids sitting there being very, very, uh, at least initially, um, barely entertained by this group of people playing music. And then eventually they get kind of riled up enough by it that they start moshing and crashing into each other. And then, like you said, Al takes it to the nth degree where these people are actually like ripping each other apart from the music. Now, again, that can just be a spoof of what we see in the original video, but there's definitely some, some, I don't know. I, I, again, I don't believe there's many accidents with this sort of thing. I think this is a very pointed display of like just how, how hopeless yeah this video I, is it's a it's a hopeless scene but this, this is video also sets. i'm gonna say this like it's a fact without doing any research but i feel confident in mm -hmm. what i'm about to say i feel like this was one of if not the first thing satirizing what was the slacker generation like like gen z or gen z uh gen x like mm -hmm. It wasn't because I don't think we got like the state sketches where they would do parodies about this until another year or two. I think the state launched in 93. Like, I think that Al's video is one of the very first things that acknowledges like there is this movement and it is and it has got this this group of kids who are just jaded. And I think that that's part of the humor. You know what I mean? Like, like there there's an easy joke in someone who has no hair on their head having this space for rent written on the back of their mm -hmm. head. But through the guise of it also being like Gen X, slacker generation, like like this jaded, apathetic, it's almost extra funny in more than just like a, hey, this guy's bald kind of way. Yeah. It's just like, this is the level of apathy that's happening right now and the level of like done and 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 deject it you know and yeah. like i think he captures it in a loving way like i can understand why people look at it and i i remember my dad's friend loved weird al until this came out and he felt so offended by the video and the the audacity to mock someone that he saw as as his generation's god like yeah. <laughs> like but i i think watching this video and every time i watch i'm like this is this Al knows exactly what is happening in music and what this movement is and what it's about and what the emotions are. And it is a very loving 
loving ribbing as opposed to, you know, the song that we bring up all the time. It's still Billy Joel to me seems so pissed off at Billy Joel as a human being. <laughs> like, like when you listen to that song. Speaking of Billy Joel to me, there are Billy Joel to me, Smells Like Nirvana and Achy Bricky Heart are always pointed at in like essays about legal history of parodies as fair use where he wouldn't have potentially needed the permission. If you look at the U.S. Copyright Act at 17 U.S.C. 107, <laughs> the idea that the uh, the effect of the use upon the potential market or value of the copyright work is considered Uh-oh. and you comment upon the original, right? So like the nature of the copyrighted work and the amount and sustainably used portion used in relation to the copyright work as a whole comments upon the original uh, evaluating the context of the work as its own freestanding thing. So still, still Billy Joel to me, achy breaky heart, smells like Nirvana. They all tie into the, looking at the piece of music from like a fourth wall, yes. right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, Whereas like fat, it's not really looking at like Michael Jackson's use of his bass line overpowering his vocals. Right. Yeah. These those three songs are legal like examples where he wouldn't have needed permission because it's fair use. So it's just interesting that like you mentioned that because I thought citing that copyright ruling is important. Yeah. yeah you know? So no, one hundred percent. It's it's very, very true. Yeah. I, I think that this is yeah, it, it, I, I that's I, I had not actually thought about that before, but that makes total sense, Lars. Cause again, it's like that's the it's all about the parody of the original thing. No other contents, no other material is factoring into <laughs> to what he's doing with the parody. It's just all completely self-referential. Yeah, this is uh, I mean, this is the th- so wizard behind the curtain listeners. Uh, we recorded this episode and let me be your hog on the same day. I'm going to spoil that. I'm going to I'm going to reveal the wizard. Wow. Uh, the reason I'm doing that is because I think it's kind of funny that uh, at this point I'm like, all right, I think it's time that we uh, can start ranking this bad boy. And I'm pretty sure that this episode will actually be shorter than our Let Me Be Your Hawk episode, which is just seems insane to me. Well, b- before we do that, I have a couple other things I really want to talk about okay. on this. Yeah, if, let's, if we don't mind. Let's get this. Um, let's get this to an hour, baby. I'm, That's I'm what... also surprised. <laughs> I'm always surprised when he does this, but Al shortened this significantly. Oh, like uh, for, a solid minute and a half or something. For, for people who listen, all of the pre-choruses are half as long as they're supposed to be. There's an instrumental break after the solos that he cuts. Um, he shortens this song, and then only then did I notice, like, the original Smells Like Teen Spirit is five minutes and one second long. Yep. For a radio single, that is really long. Even the video, when they edit it for the video, it's still four minutes and 30-something seconds. Yeah. Like, they, they, like, maybe trim down the outro. I think for the radio, maybe, that was yeah, yeah. But the, uh, uh, you know, all of the, uh, the hello, hello, hello. Al just shortens all of that. I guess yeah. there was just not any more <laughs> joke to put in there, and it was just <laughs> felt like extra air. But it's rare that he changes the form of a song like that, so that surprised me to see. Um, a, a great little fun thing I found here. The, and it's funny because it. Another one of those songs where it feels like there is audio jokes that are specific to the video, but have ma- have made it into the actual recording of the track. And one of them is like, so he does the gargling of the solo. Uh, the guitar solo is gargled, and then there's a group of kids playing it on kazoo. And then after that, it's a lonely tuba that <laughs> plays the line. The tuba part, they brought in a special guest, and the special guest tuba player is a guy named Tommy Johnson who was a professional orchestral tuba player. Guys, Tommy Johnson is the guy who played the tuba, the lead tuba melody line to the score to Jaws. Oh my God. (laughs) That guy. That's great. Good job, man. That guy is playing the tuba solo in Smells Like Nirvana. Uh, I, I love the fact that they brought in someone who is that heavy a hitter to play this goofy throwaway, a three note tuba part i mean i guess to be fair jaws is a two-note part but uh, still um that's 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 crazy it just blew my mind that that was uh that that, that's him so yeah there's a good fun fact tommy johnson tuba player extraordinaire uh and then uh only other note i had here is uh specifically um chris novoselic was asked about this music video talking about like how people felt about it and he said that they were actually nervous when they signed off on the video. He says they thought that they were going to be torn apart by Al. And when they watched it, they just loved it. Yeah. They thought it was really, really good. I I think that it's a great example of, of, um, 
Al making fun of it while also clearly getting the message behind the original. And in my opinion, again, I it's interesting to think about people who saw this and felt like he was Al was just absolutely destroying one of their idols. Yeah. But to me, this feels like the perfect example of like making fun of it while clearly also completely supporting the message behind the original song. It's a really difficult line to it's, walk. I was going to say, it, when you watch the video, it's it's almost like he he's he's doing everything in such subtle ways. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like where it's like when it gets to the end where they're tearing each other apart and everything like it's not that far off from the chaos that ensues at the end of the real video. It's just Correct. like cranked up just a little bit more, like mm -hmm. a little bit more absurd. Um, Probably one of my favorite bits in the whole, I, I even as I'm nearing my forties, uh, things being slapped out of people's hands is always funny to me. So between Dick Van Patten trying to pass a sandwich to somebody and it getting slapped out of his hand, or the Girl Scouts <laughs> walking up to the mosh pit and having their cookies smacked into the air, uh, I mean, those get chuckles on me, but it's the green screen effect of the guy walking across the bleachers, eating a banana, looking at Nirvana, and then looking like he's about to throw up and quickly running out of the shot is like, has never not been hilarious to me yeah. to witness. Every yeah, no, time. it's, it's, yeah, I, agreed, agreed. We didn't even talk about Dick Van Patten being in this video. Or or what about the, the Billy Barty cameo, Noodles McIntyre with the cat with the light. Exactly. Yeah, throwback to UHF. Uh, throwback yeah. to UHF. Exactly. Exactly. Billy Barty also that's a appearing cute here. Moment. That was that's a great one too. Yeah. It's um. Oh, oh yeah, and the, the only other uh, this is not a video note, but I just had to point this out because it was so interesting to me when this song came out as a single. Do you, either of you guys know what the B side was to this song as a single? Uh, yes, I, it was tra traffic traffic. No, Waffle King. It was Waffle, Waffle King. King, which didn't get released until Alapalooza. I can explain this for you, though. I uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. So Waffle King was recorded for this, um, and then while they were waiting for the big parody to show up, uh, they had written a few other originals, and one of them that they wrote was I Was Only Kidding, and the I Was Only Kidding song features a reference to Wayne's World where they stop and say not, and Al became concerned that if they waited until the next album, the popularity of Wayne's World would go away. So he was like, well, Waffle King's the most evergreen song that we have of all of these. So let's let's hold Waffle King and put I Was Only Kidding in the slot that Waffle King would have been on in this album. I mean, it's so interesting to think that Al thought that the, the idea of saying not was going to go out of fashion. <laughs> uh, because funny enough, I... I've seen Wayne's World, of course, but I would have not even remembered that that was the actual origin of that. At this point in time, <laughs> all these years back, it didn't. I wouldn't have remembered that that was the origin of someone saying not. Yeah. Um, Today's generation's like, why is he doing that Borat joke so loud? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. <laughs> um, well, before we get to, is there anything else, Lars? Did you have anything else you wanted to to add on this one? Two last yes, things. Yes. Go. Right, two go, last go. 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 There was a great essay that came out a few years ago about how the SoundCloud mumblecore rappers. Um, where you have to like really Google their lyrics for a meaning is kind of in the tradition of Nirvana, right? There was that song by rich homie Quan called lifestyle where like famously on genius, no one could agree on what the heck they were saying. And like, <laughs> this is like cold debate, this idea that like the emotion through which you express yourself is more important than the succinctness of how you express that clarity and how that's an example of like post Reagan era um, during the Bush administration and like post George W. Bush is this example of like the younger generation is looking for clarity and therefore their lyrics don't have to express it. The other thing that affects that obviously is recreational heroin use. Yes. <laughs> well, so like the mumble core. <laughs> yes. And so that's, and so the, so like Nirvana falls into that category, but weird Al's whole thing is like his lyrics are so distinct. Yeah. He has to sing them distinctly and that how do you play on that? And like, or, or do anything where every chorus, the lyrics change. So you add more jokes. Mm -hmm. Like that's always a songwriting thing I try to emulate where it's annoying when you're trying to teach robot kills to your backy band, <laughs> but like you keep changing the lyrics. You know what I say? Like, I know nothing happens like, twice. So it, yeah. Yeah. So like how, how you take that whole like reactionary aesthetic choice to not make sense. And then how to make the lyrics very clear and make sense. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was an interesting point. And also Agreed. I didn't realize this, the world, the most famous, touring nirvana cover band right now do you guys know their name no it smells like nirvana really oh shit 
and they tour so much they sell huge venues and they're super popular and i i, I it has to be a, a tribute to al's parody it, or yeah. just a coincidence no it has to be like, i no, that's interesting yeah. like is there legally like would would al have to approve that that's an interesting maybe not i know you can't copyright a song Probably title not. Um, especially a song title that has someone else's copyright in the in the in the name already. You probably can't copyright a derivative song, especially title. not yeah. a derivative one. Yeah, exactly. But but that's a, a fun fact Maybe. for people listening. You can't actually copyright the name of a song. If anyone wants to write a song called "Stairway to Heaven," you're free to do that. Yeah. Um, it, it can't. Are you serious? Yeah. You you cannot copyright a title. Um, it. it so what if your song is called called uh, a copywritten word? Yeah. What well, if, that's what if, that's a different yeah. thing. If you yeah. if you're using someone else's copyright, the only example of that I have is a, a they might be giants reference because uh, I know that band so well. They had a song that was called Nyquil Driver, and they found out that they couldn't say that. It's it's in yeah. the lyrics of the song, like the lyric can say that because that's just like part of poetic license. But if it's a, if it's a name on a the back of a like CD. Um, it can't have a copyrighted. Well, that uh, was the controversy with Barbie Girl, right? Like when the song Barbie Girl came out, like they're like, you can't. I, I mean, they were also very upset with what the lyrics were, but then it was also like, we, no one gave you the permission. No one gave you permission to name yeah. the song Barbie. Yeah. Like <laughs> I also know No Effects named an album "Pump Up the Valium," and they had to misspell the word Valium, so it wasn't the same as the copyrighted pharmaceutical product yeah um so I, there's there's or, workarounds and stuff like that but i i believe i again ignoring the fact that if it, if you're using someone else's copyright that would be a uh uh you uh, like a, a phrase as a song title or a word as a song title you couldn't be like no one else is allowed to write a song called stairway to heaven no one else is allowed to write a song called um smells like teen spirit you couldn't do that although funny enough teen spirit also is a brand yeah. i don't know what i'm saying yeah. anymore <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're, we're all losing it. Um, the last thing I want to say before we get into the rankings uh, is uh, great essay. I have talked about essays by this guy before. Chuck Klosterman uh, has mm. a really interesting essay just about Kurt Cobain. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's in his book, Killing Yourself to Live. Yes. Uh, but it might be in a different essay book. But I he think points that's out, the one, yeah. But he points out something that he talked about. like By the time they go to record in utero, Kurt Cobain was a little tired of people trying to analyze the the lyrics that he had written um especially because like we said a lot of those songs were just like hey what syllables make the most sense with the melody line like they're not the most important thing they're just like what we're doing um he's like so his solution was that instead people would stop bothering him and trying to analyze his lyrics about his life that in utero almost every song would be written about books he's like not even thinking for one second that what that would ultimately do is make people analyze, well, why did he write a song about the book Perfume? Why did he write a song about this? But like, like right. it's like he could not, It it's, I, I just wanted to bring it up as the sad state of like, Kurt Cobain is probably going to always be one of the most interesting popular figures of our generation because it's like this duality of having a message that you want to spread and, and wanting a level of fame but also wanting there to be a specific cap to that level of fame that you have no control over uh and what that does to someone's mind <laughs> like, yeah we, we we talked about it a little bit as a group in our last in the let me be your hog episode about the idea of like especially at this moment in time like you couldn't you needed to go through this capitalist system to get your message out there it was the double-edged sword of the whole thing you could i rage against the machine was the example we gave there but yeah. this is this works too it's like if you want to send a message about bringing the system down you needed to use that system <laughs> for people to hear what you had to say and it, that was just a compromise people had to make and obviously kurt i mean he struggled with a lot of things but he clearly really struggled with that yeah um and the idea that he had to become a celebrity to uh talk about things that were should have been the absolute antithesis of celebrity. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something that's going back to Al as a person, someone who kind of eschews celebrity, like I'm better than everyone else. He's so good to his fans. Mm -hmm. He's so humble. He's all about the music. He's so kind. I feel like Kurt and Al have that sort of uh, definitely perspective. It's like Kurt Cobain is like the bizarro world, dark version of weird. Yes. Al. You know what I mean? Totally. Like similar, similar background, kind of sheltered as a kid, really smart, really sensitive. If Al, Al being a straight edge Christian dude, you know, his life ended up being a little more full of light and joy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's but there's similar archetypes. No, uh, very, yeah. very true. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and, uh, and yeah, we've talked many times on the show about how Al will constantly poke fun at celebrity and, uh, where art and commerce, 
uh, collide with each other and all of that kind of stuff. So it, it makes total sense that these two would have had a very similar overall message despite hitting it from very different angles. Speak, speak of things hitting, Matt. Matt K. Yes. Alapalooza probably didn't hit because there wasn't the same cultural zeitgeist moment that Smells Like Nirvana had. It was all the hangover of of the grunge era, Aerosmith and Billy Ray Cyrus. If he'd had another moment that he could have hit, that album, I think, would have resonated better. That album that's, came out at a really weird musical time, for sure. It, it's also just, and, and we'll get into it sooner rather than later because we're one... Uh, just a couple episodes away from diving into it. Mm -hmm. But there's just a lot of weird, there's a lot of strange choices throughout that album in yeah. the sense of, you know, instead of jumping on a popular song at the time, it was like, well, let me just grab a vintage song and talk about a popular movie <laughs> at this time instead. Like that was a very strange call for him to do and have that be the lead single off of an album. Well, our conversation today certainly explained one thing that I always was confused by in Alapalooza, which is why he has two what seem to be very obvious Peter Gabriel style parodies on the yep. same record. And that's uh, why. And it's because he pushed Waffle King and then also yep. didn't want to cut Talk Soup. Um, yeah. But again, we'll we'll cover that in a few months. In a few months. All right. <laughs> so, guys, here's probably the hardest part about this episode is figuring out where to rank Smells Like Nirvana amongst so many juggernaut parodies yeah. that have happened in his career. Um, I'm scrolling around here and I think I'm going to put am I I'm do, I'm putting this on my number two. Right <laughs> right below my favorite parody. I think I'm a clone now. Uh is <laughs> smells like Nirvana for me on my list. Uh Matt Milligan, how about yourself over there? I'm gonna put it a little bit lower this is a big one this is one of those it um, i'm thinking about what we talked about with eat it which is where it's it's such a fundamental owl track that not putting it at the very top feels unfair because it's just like i said this is one of those songs like if this song doesn't come out if this song does not become a huge hit if the stars don't align perfectly we're not doing this show al is not the person that we now think of him as um having said that I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it just above fat, okay. which means I'm actually still putting it. It's just below. I lost on Jeopardy for me, and that when I say it out loud, that seems silly. But also, I think I don't know. It's just my own. I, I can't. I just love that song so much. And even now, looking at it, like I, there's a satisfaction I get out of like six words long that I don't even get out of this in terms of like overall cleverness. This is also just like just such a milestone track for Al. And this really does set the tone for uh, arguably his entire career from here on out, like is changed by the success of this song. All right. So I'm going to number four. Forget. Very respectable. Now, I won't forget this. I infamously forget this every time we record a music video. Yes. Thinking about where to put the music video. And I think for this one, uh, I am going to put it at number three. Uh, I'm going to put it. I have Dare to be Stupid as my number one, Fat as my number two, and Now Smells Like Nirvana as my number three. Um, just because I think that similarly to how Dare to be Stupid is just a visually unbelievable music video to watch, and it really captures everything that Devo represented, and Fat is such a great usage of like the cinematic element of this like 12 minute bad video and like consolidating it into like yeah. a almost pitch perfect representation smells like nirvana does just an equally good job of doing the same thing but i think that fat has way better jokes uh per second throughout it than smells like nirvana i would agree i'm gonna put it in the exact same spot as you i think that like we talked about on the fat episode that is like that video is everything on that yeah. song like that that song is elevated so much by the jokes within that video and that i think makes it I feel like it needs to be ranked higher for just how effective it is as a music video. This is a great video. And like I said, it's funny and also very dark and very like the, the violence in it. And the it, it's, it's impressively done. Like fat was another one where fat, they got to shoot it in the same place with some of the same uh, set design and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, it's I, that one is just funny. I don't know. They're very, very close. I almost yeah. put it at number two, but uh, I think that's a good spot. Number three. All right. And lastly, Lars, 
amongst the gang. Uh, the, oh my god, amongst the guest rankings, not the gang rank. We're gonna rankings. call them the gankings now. <laughs> uh, where where do you see "Smells Like Nirvana" falling? Before I give you that, I want to drop a tangential <laughs> trivia note. Yes, quick. Kurt Cobain famously didn't like the Tool Sober video because it was a ripoff of some German director. The dude who did the Tool Sober video also did Gr Green Jelly's Three Little Pigs. Mm. And part of the animation crew on Three Little Pigs worked on Jurassic, Jurassic Park, Park, which was the single for the next That's record. That's right. And so Green Jelly, going back to the point you made, had to change her name from Green Jello because they had a copyright there it is. The title. Yeah. So I thought I'd draw that connection. Cobain's disdain for the animation pain <laughs> became Alapalooza's Visual stain. Hey, that. <laughs> Look at that. You're gonna I, write a. I would put make a song about the history of oh, Weird Al and Nirvana. Like, <laughs> that was a great glimpse into the creative whole, process. It could be a whole album. I was Nirvana. Smells like Nirvana is number one. Everything. There you go. Best video he's ever done. Will do. Number one. Everything. And bump. Would I bump? Whatever was at number one is now number two, bro. Okay. <laughs> Does well, that you, work? well, you already that did work? that, but you can move something else. I know you were shocked that Money for Nothing is all the way at the bottom of the list underneath Living with a Hernia. If you want to, yeah, I'd give Living with a Hernia be be below Money for Nothing. All right, Here so just go. swap you those two at the very bottom there. You can take you can take Money for Nothing as high as you want to take it. Honestly, Money for Nothing. Then I take all the way up to uh, Money for Nothing is above Hot Rocks Polka. All right, there we go. Look at that. All right, well, Lars. We, uh, we did successfully go over an hour with Smells Like Nirvana. Real quick, if people were loving this, mclars.com, the best spot for people to keep up on all the crazy things that you've been up to? Yes, please, and thank you, Matt K. Of course. We will be back to dive more into the deep end uh, with next week's episode on Trigger Happy. Thank you so much for doing this again, Lars. We really appreciate yep. it. You are, you are we love brilliant. You. You guys are brilliant. And be sure to catch Weedus with MC Frontline on their nine-month <laughs> tour of Southwest England. <laughs> Your grandma's basement, we're playing it. Nine months, a radius of pub. four miles. We're hitting every <laughs> single local pub that they have. And hear Fred, hear Fred a lot play songs from 1997 <laughs> for two hours. <laughs> or or something from both of his albums in this in the last decade. Oh, God. Oh, my God. <laughs> Love you guys. listening to the Geekscape Network.